I th- we should get your mom and my mom uh, to meet sometime. I think we, they would like each other. We should get them together on the podcast. That's what we <gasps> should do. And welcome back to another episode of Exposing Ourselves. I'm Travis Ritchie, and this is episode 39. This is the show where we expose each other to new things. Matt, a big music fan, will assign me one of his favorite music artists to listen to each week, and I, a movie buff, will give him one of my favorite films, and we come together on this very podcast to discuss it all. And with me, as always, is my very good friend, Matt Runquist. Hey, Travis, how you doing? This week, I watched the movie Call Me By Your Name, and you listened to the band Screaming Females, but you also had a little bit of a cameo from Sufjan Stevens. Oh, yeah, technically. Uh, well, that is the reason, uh, ostensibly, that I assigned Call Me By Your Name, oh, which okay. admittedly is not a favorite film of mine, uh, which is the, you know, the kind of the assignment of this podcast. Okay. Uh, but it is a movie, it is a movie that I saw w- around when it came out or when it was vying for awards during awards season. And uh, I, I watched it then, um, and, and certainly didn't disenjoy it. If that is a, if that is a word. It's but, not, uh, but, uh, let's get into the, y- you uh, get the, the, you get the appetizers. idea. I didn't dislike yeah. it, but yeah, I, yeah. um, but it wasn't, it hasn't been a favorite anyway. So, uh, we'll, we'll get to that, uh, in a bit, but before we do, how was your week, my friend? I had a very, uh, interesting week. Yeah. I got to go on a little mini vacation. We discussed it a little bit last week that I went up to the twin cities I got to go up to the Minnesota Renaissance Festival on what they call Fair Friday. So the last weekend of the fair, they have a third day of enjoyment, and that is the Friday before the last weekend. Uh, So my wife and I got to do that along with the couple that we were in the Twin Cities to visit who are having a baby. And so there's a baby shower on Saturday. Probably of most interest to you, though, was Uh that my wife and I went to the Mall of America on Saturday morning uh-huh. before uh, before the the party because my wife had never been to the Mall of America before. Really? And you and I used to go run around the Mall of America like maniacs. Yeah. Uh, and, so often that, uh, that it stopped being big to us. Yeah. Like, do you remember? Well, I don't know that it ever stopped being big. We certainly made it smaller. Well, it uh, stopped feeling like, yeah. it, like I, the first time you walk into the Mall of America, it's overwhelmingly large. Yes. But then as you get used to it, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go here and there and there. And you go around this corner and that's where the Apple store is and that's where the theater mm-hmm. is and just make your way through it. And yeah. it stops feeling impressive. But. Yeah. It, well, you know, you just relax into it a little bit and you take some deep breaths and you really you eventually get used to the size. Yeah, I was just. <laughs> that's, I get confused there. Uh, I'm not a blue. I really, to your, to I your... really thought he was going to do straight face there. I really thought he was not going to react at all to that. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hip to your, uh, to your you, you innuendos. Innuendos. Uh, hey, also, uh, but I, I oh. weirdly, I was just talking to someone about the Mall of America myself. So that's that is of interest to me. Yeah, and then, what did your wife think? Uh, She quite enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Of course, she had the best tour guide, and so uh, it was a lot of fun for her. The uh, thing that I think might be of most interest to you is that I bought something at Games by James, which is still right where it has always been. There, right at that uh, that big atrium. Uh, That's great. Still a locally owned store, still doing just fine. Uh, So that was really fun. It was exciting for me. I do remember when we used to go, uh, there were, I don't remember if this was a regular occurrence, but I do remember taking the bus to the Mall of America because yeah. there wasn't a, I think now they have a a, a, a train, like, yeah. a, like a metro train or something like that that goes there. But we used to have to take two bus. buses, I think. Uh, I thought we were, if you walked across to the West Bank, it was uh-huh. one bus. One bus, okay. Yeah. It was, so the, the West uh, Bank stop. But we used to like there was a time, and I don't remember why, but we did. I was doing this acting exercise or something, and I decided that uh, I my character was uh, on the spectrum heavily, and you were my kind of caretaker. And I don't think I told you that's what I was going to be doing, but you <laughs> fell into it. Uh, you, you did play the part um, very well, and so we'd just be talking with strangers. I'm a natural actor, and I think, you know, if you were ever casting a YouTube 
uh, series that you would say, be, say a time travel comedy. Yeah, like a time travel <laughs> comedy would be really an ideal uh, usage for my talents. But you know, it'll probably never happen. So, well, I'll tell you what. I will. I will definitely have you in mind for season two if season two happens, uh, oh. and uh, it, if we have a budget to fly you out. Oh, um, that would be. I, I could definitely think of several roles for you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. How was your week, Travis? It was uh, it was interesting. It was not without its events. And uh, we I did a couple of um a couple of classes at my acting workshop, like three classes. It was definitely a busy week and uh, we had a uh, let's see, I had I did therapy, which was like the first, because I missed a couple of weeks because my therapist was out. I did, uh, uh, I applied for a job at the Apple store uh, for seasonal work. I don't know why, I just, I think I got a little tired of being um, not working because of the strike, which uh, as as we mentioned last week, is uh, at an end at least for the writers, it looks like. they They still technically have to vote to ratify the contract, but I'm hearing that a bunch of writers are back to work tomorrow yeah everyone seems very confident that it's going to pass yeah me too so so that's really nice and then one really amazing thing though happened yesterday i went to i was invited to a friend's show my friend cortez he's uh, in my acting group and he it's so funny i've known him for years now but only within the last year or year and a half have little snippets of his life come to light and because uh, he he was kind of a uh i don't know I don't know if he's an introvert, but he has kind of a very quiet personality, right? He's uh, he's adorable, but just kind of quiet. And over the last couple of uh, years, I've learned that he used to sing. He used to be a backup singer for Liza Minnelli. Wow! And uh, and and so toured all over the world with her, and has all these stories. And and so we started playing tennis together, and we started doing all this other stuff. Uh, I didn't realize that he was he's quite a bit older me older than me but he whooped my butt in tennis mm-hmm. and uh, like he is amazingly in shape for um for a gentleman of his age and uh but any and, and he looks amazing and and so now uh, none of that is 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 germane to this point but he did a show <laughs> Where he invited me to this show where he was going to sing something like 15 or 16 songs from the 60s. It was like, Cortez sings songs from the 60s. And I don't know what I expected. I mean, I guess I do know what I expected. I expected it to be like he was going to be kind of a, a crooner type of thing, you know, singing songs from the 60s. Which I'm not a fan of, generally speaking. But there are definitely great songs from the 60s. I was not prepared for the emotional resonance of this show i was in tears by the end of it uh because well partly because he throw no he throws in this song maybe second or third to the end that he wrote for his mom and he's sitting there and he plays the piano Aww. and he plays the piano what i didn't know that and he's singing this absolutely gorgeous song uh i think it's called pilot bird and it's it's wonderful and I'm and I'm kind of tearing up from that and then he sings you are my sunshine mm-hmm. which it, and it was just so beautiful he got choked up and of course I got choked up because that's a song I I used to sing with my mom and um anyway it was it was a really great show and so I got to give a shout out to Cortez for uh, for that um, experience because it was one of the most surprisingly moving experiences uh, of my life well, that is just wonderful. That is yeah. really sweet. Yeah, it was great. It uh, it makes me want to sing more, and uh, so that's one thing. But also, you know, it goes to the point of he he made a thing happen. He wanted to perform, and even though he has been a singer for a long, long time, he has never had a show of his own, and he wanted to make mm-hmm. sure that he was uh, uh, that he had that opportunity so and i love that he did that for himself and that's what i tell people all the time you know if you're creative be a producer that is really sweet i you know i love uh, there are documentaries on netflix about some of the backup singers from the 60s whose voices we really know but whose names we haven't necessarily known i think it's called 20 feet from stardom or something like that 
Oh, really, really fantastic stuff. And, y- you know, the the vagaries of how some people become headliners and some people live their lives as backup singers is, uh, you know, I mean, it's it, right. You don't want to say it's all luck, but it, like there are a bunch of things out of one's control that determine mm-hmm. who is on the top of the ticket and who is standing in the yep. background. And uh, all, all of those people are immensely talented. And I give all the props in the world to the backup singers and to the, to the, you know, third row actors and, and yeah. all, all of those people. Oh yeah. In, in fact, Cortez had a, a trio of backup singers for him and he gave each of them a song to sing uh, that showcased their talents, which was really uh, wonderful. And uh, in, in particular, I talked to one uh, by the name of Lisa Donahue and she was, uh, she did a version of, uh, I believe, Downtown mm-hmm. that was stunning and, uh, and, and brought the house down. So yeah, just a, a really great show and so much fun. And I went with a bunch of my collaborative friends and so we all supported Cortez and uh, it was a packed house. So that was nice to see too. Um, was one of his other backup singers Liza Minnelli? No. Missed opportunity there. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, unfortunately, she's having a hard time with things these days. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Well, we should probably get into the meat, Travis. I Absolutely. apologize Let's for going so Let's get to the so meat. Uh, should we shave things up and do uh, do the movie first? <laughs> I like how you refuse to commit. Even even when you started the, the word, you're like, they're both M words. I can wait. I can wait. Movie, <laughs> movie first. That is, tell yes, me, okay. tell me about right. "Call Me by Your well, Name." Well, I had you watch uh, "Call Me by Your Name," which is a 2017 uh, film. It's a coming of age romantic drama. Uh, it's uh, got a heavy LGBT theme, and uh, it stars uh, notably uh, Timothy Chalamet as uh, the as the 17 year old. Uh, uh, you know, kind of a he's like it comes from a jewish like franco italian family um it's very interesting cuz they 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 talk about being jewish but they also speak italian and french and um it's kind of fascinating anyway so he plays elio and uh they his dad is a well-known um professor and the professor gets a, a graduate student assistant uh in and, and who is in the story, he's supposed to be 24 years old, but it is played by Army Hammer, who feels a little older than that. Um, but um, but yeah, so uh, then Elio and the uh, graduate student, whose name is Oliver, um, have a slow kind of development of their relationship that turns into uh, love. And uh, by the end of it, of course, Oliver has to leave, and Elio is left um, without his first love. And if you remember, I think it focuses a lot on how hard you fall that first time. When you're mm-hmm. young, you fall very hard for for the, the people that you fall in love with. And so it really kind of looks at that, but it also has a, uh, a fairly supportive, kind uh, attitude towards their love and uh, it takes place in 1983 and so you wouldn't necessarily expect that uh, but uh, everyone involved like their uh, Elio's parents are understanding and kind of supportive of of their relationship and um, and are there for their son when he has to go through this heartbreak so um, that's pretty much it and and that being the entirety of the plot is one of the things we'll talk about. But uh, what did you think of Call Me By Your Name? Yeah, so while I was watching this movie, I did have a little bit of a surreal experience in that uh, I didn't know that this... you In the intro, you had kind of said, oh, this wasn't necessarily one of my favorite movies. While I was watching the movie, I was like, I'm really surprised that this is one of Travis's favorite movies because it's very slow. Uh, yes. the, the pace of this movie is languid, and it's a throwback to what I would say like European cinema of the 70s and 80s. So mm-hmm. in a way, right, it places it in the time that it is set. Uh, mm-hmm. But this is, this is, I would say, almost art film-ish. There's a lot of scenes that don't necessarily feel like they have an explicit purpose. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And if yeah. I was like a producer on this movie, I'm like, I would be like, do we need, do we need like seven scenes in a row that are like two lines? Like, 
maybe maybe we could not have to spend all this money on doing a setup for like <laughs> for like how are you Elio? I'm fine. And then like there's just like, you know, or staring intently, you know, from the from the upper window towards the pool or you mm-hmm. know. So I, so let's yeah, so let's Okay, we're in art film mode now. Okay, we're trying to judge it yeah, as an yeah. art film, not as like a sure. Which really, I guess, surprised me because this movie. I was actually surprised to hear it was six years old, uh, because I feel like it's kind of been talked about a lot, and it was yeah. it, like it made a bit of a splash, right? Yeah, and uh, you know, I just I thought it was more recent. Uh, I'm surprised that this got as much action as it did so none of that is to say it's a bad movie it's just very much out of the mainstream of like american movie making and american movie watching right now Mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. slow very deliberate very um very much about like setting itself in a time and a place and establishing that time and place um and and not mostly explicitly right like yes you learn that his father is a professor um and that they get a graduate student every every summer, and this is the graduate student, you know. But most of the most of the rest of the plot is very told, sort of sideways and through implication. And mm-hmm, there's mm-hmm. there is a lot of like sort of staring longingly, and you're just supposed to read what the person is feeling. But the people are sort of emotionally repressed, or and Elio seems to be out of touch with his own emotions for huge portions of this movie so that's all my my being as generous as i possibly can be to this movie okay if i was gonna read this movie i would say something like horny 17 year old doesn't really understand how hormones work and falls in love with a slightly older man you know and basically yeah that's kind of the whole plot right yep yep um not a lot more to it yeah and so he's very precocious right like that's one of the things that uh attracts oliver to him is that elio is very intelligent and he demonstrates Mm -hmm. this very early in the film when the professor tests oliver and elio says oh yeah he does that every summer right like you know, even when I was 15 and 16 and 14, I was I was picking up on this sort of intense academic question that my father uses to judge the the uh, graduate students that come to visit them in Italy. Right. 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 Yeah. Um, so I should I should probably get into how I felt about this movie. I, the, the acting, I think, is really great. You mm-hmm. know, um, I believe everybody in it. Uh, I don't love this script, you know, it feels very, very, if this was, and I told this to my wife after the movie was over, if this had been a 12 minute short film with no dialogue, I would have loved this. It would Hmm. have been a perfect little, you know, like window into this intense romantic relationship that has like a little bit of conflict and then resolves right as a two-hour movie it drags a lot and Mm -hmm. there's just not much to sustain the story you know do i want to give it a little bit for being like a gay story because this is an lgbt this is gay right this is a gay story Mm -hmm. um or bisexual maybe but like you know exploratory sure whatever um you know and i want to man right it's definitely man on man i you know i want to give it like a little bit of leeway for being like this is a story that we've heard a million times before but not told about this type of person right um but there there's just a lot of times in this movie when you're like yeah i get it he's like totally horny for the grad student like let's (laughs) go right like come on right yeah but of course the gra- uh, Oliver has like really conflicted feelings and there's a girl involved who Elio has been pursuing as well. Uh, and it's not clear if he's doing that to, to make 
Oliver jealous or if he's just doing that because he's horny and and he's expected to be interested in girls and or he is interested in girls like like there's a few unanswered questions there which I think Elio has not really answered for himself and so yeah you know I tell I I need you to talk a little bit though I feel like I've been talking forever well, so I think you're spot on on a lot of this. I think the uh, the pace of the movie is uh, is languid is a great word you use. Uh, it's not glacial. It's not. Mm-hmm. There have been movies I've watched where I've just been like, yeah, get on with it. I think that um, I don't think this would have worked as a short or or would have been as powerful because one of the things I do like, and I think you've covered a lot of the things that I also mm-hmm. maybe didn't love. The script is a little simplistic, but also I really enjoyed the um, the complexity of the characters. Uh, and I think it's important to to really internalize the fact that this is set in 1983, especially for when I look at my own coming out experience and, uh, you know, be going to college in 19... 19- 95 and having no idea what gay was uh until you know a kind of like got uh, the internet there was certainly no representation mm-hmm. on television or or in movies you know not that it not that it was popular or positive and so i imagine that uh elio's uh journey especially as a 17 year old i guess that would have been close to where i was too uh he he may expect from himself that he's supposed to be into girls Mm -hmm. and he doesn't really understand this attraction that he has to this man and um and so the his his uh internal like debate and his his conflict is so i think clear in this and i and i really love that they made him intelligent like he is he is a product he plays piano he can take a music piece by Bach and play it in three different three different styles he speaks three different languages he's he's a very smart young man and uh, and I think that you're right that's part of what uh Oliver is attracted to uh in addition to you know it's Timothy Chalamet so it's like you know super cute twink what are you gonna do uh and the but I I I think that the the journey of their of their relationship is interesting because it takes a long time for them to kind of connect mm-hmm. because you know Elio is trying to trying to figure out whether Oliver likes him and Oliver is trying to be distant because there is that you know seven year age gap so Oliver's being like uh, I don't know if this is okay and, um, and but Elio kind of has to take a first step, which is hard for you to do as a young person. So, like, it takes a long time for them to actually connect, and then once they do, it's fiery and and kind of, like, in, it's very intense for both of them, and they, uh, and, and I don't know, I really enjoyed that, and I thought that uh, Timothy Chalamet, I think, was nominated for an Oscar for this performance, and I think deservedly so uh it's it's a complex and nuanced performance that um i didn't appreciate the first time i watched it i don't Mm -hmm. think and uh and now on my second time through i really did uh engage with it um more i do agree that it's slow it felt slow even in my even the second time through i thought it would have been served with being shot with maybe a better a better camera. I think one of the things they did was use technology that was of its time too. So they probably shot it in very much a, a 1983 style. That's what it mm-hmm. looked like to me. But I would have loved, especially when they finally go out on their on their vacation, on their you know holiday mm-hmm. together. They they both uh, with their parents, you know, ag- acknowledgement and permission. Uh, Oliver takes Elio to the country and mm-hmm. they explore together and they have this holiday just the two of them and i would have loved if they would have shifted from this kind of 16 millimeter look or you know kind of grainy look of the rest of the film into like a lush colorful like mm-hmm. you know i don't know yeah no i film that, look yeah i but, think it um, definitely could have stood to be a little bit you know, flashier from a cinematography standpoint. And it's funny because that part of the movie is actually pretty short, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I, 
and I'll give the movie props for this. Like nominally this graduate student is there for six weeks and this mm-hmm. all feels like very natural. Like there's a couple of weeks of like, you know, futzing around and sort of playing, playing footsie for a little bit. And then there's a week or two where, uh, where Oliver actually pulls away a little bit. Like they get close and then Oliver like pulls away feeling like maybe he shouldn't initiate any kind of contact and then elio sort of pulls him in and there's like an in a week or two of very intense romance and then there's a few days i think it's actually in the city not in the country but a few days the two of them go off to parma or something i don't and, know but they uh, do go out into the country they do, and are, they, are find a waterfall somewhere and it's beautiful looking but yeah yeah um and, and I then think that, it's the metaphor and, being that when they're out away from other yeah. people, they can be truly themselves. Right. And then that, and then that's over, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then there's that, uh, you know, that depressing little epilogue where Oliver's like, "Yeah, I'm engaged to a woman," and you know. Yep. And then there was my favorite scene of the movie, which is when Elio's father sort of has a little, almost a d. Uh, a decompression session with him uh, where mm-hmm. he talks about, yeah, I knew what was going on and it is important for you to feel the feelings that you feel and to not suppress them. And it's funny because I didn't get this at all, but my wife was like, was like, is the father saying that he was gay too? And I was like, I picked I... up on that a little myself. It seems like he was admitting to having those feelings when he was younger, but not really pursuing them. See, yeah. I just read that as him saying, like, that he perhaps wanted to explore more, not necessarily in terms of, like, gender, you know, partnership, but just, like, that every time you make a choice in life, you're also closing off other sure. choices. And it's yeah. important that if you, if something is something that you want to experience, that you need to choose it yeah. actively. Or it yeah. will pass you by, I, but I could. I don't think that you and and my wife are are objectively wrong about it at all. You know, it certainly well, yeah. could be that could be the interpretation that is, you know, correct. Or maybe it's sure. art, and whatever interpretation is in your head is is correct. But yeah, yeah, it, it may or may not be. Um... Uh, the case, I don't know. Uh, the father is played by Michael Stilberg, by the way, who is a kind of a character actor. He's been around for quite a while. Uh, and it's interesting. I recently saw him in the show uh, Your Honor opposite, um, uh, opposite Brian Cranston. And he played kind of a mob boss character who is okay. like vicious. And it was so... It was a very strikingly opposite performance uh, between mm. that and this. But uh, yeah. yeah, I loved his his kind of like laissez-faire very european um attitude towards uh towards elio and and maybe the whole movie has that kind of european uh, kind of aesthetic uh not only look but also their uh, the way they the way they approach sexuality um what's interesting is that uh oliver comes in as an american student so he is coming from america and that kind of um you know mental attitude um coming into this relationship and so that might be part of where he was so frustrated not frustrated but confused and conflicted sure sure yeah yeah i i certainly know what it's like to see an actor in two wildly different role uh roles uh one after the next my my classic example of this is uh mark ruffalo who uh i watched the avengers but Less than mm-hmm. a week before, I had watched The Kids Are All Right, where okay. he, he absolutely rails Julianne Moore at one point oh. in that movie. And it was it was a very, very stark contrast to <laughs> The Incredible Hulk. And oh, interesting. I, I, I didn't realize that he was with Julianne Moore in, in that. I haven't seen that yet, but I just watched a different movie with the two of them called Blindness. And uh, ah, okay. it was the two of them together. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he comes between Julianne Moore and her wife in that in that movie. Well, um, I, so the movie itself did pretty well. It was uh, let's see, it uh, only cost three and a half million to make, and I think you can see that. You know, when you're looking yeah. at a movie of 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 such stark 
uh, film technology yeah. being used. You know, you can see that. Uh, and it made uh, 43 million in the box office, so it was a mild success. Uh, and for a drama like this, really, what more can you expect? Um, the thing I really wanted the reason i chose it was because um Sufjan stevens did two original songs three. for the movie uh three original songs uh, a mystery of love visions of gideon and um one other one f uh futile devices Is that, that right? sounds that right. sounds right it seems like the kind um, of thing he would write and so i i, I you know having been recently exposed to Sufjan, i i really wanted to uh to um you know, kind of see it in context, which I thought was actually a, a really interesting thing. All yeah. right, cool. Yeah. Um, I did have one question for you before mm -hmm. we move on to ratings. So I knew that Timothy Chalamet was a twink. Is there mm -hmm. is there a gay <laughs> subculture shorthand for whatever Army Hammer is in this? Oh yeah, I think he would have probably been a, a jock. A jock. Yeah, I get that. I get that yeah. a lot. Yeah, okay. But I didn't realize that was that meant something to the gays. Oh yeah, yeah. Kind of active, muscly. Um it's definitely it's definitely one of the one of the selections you can make in Grinder <laughs> uh, <laughs> for your excellent. for your tribe. Well, now uh, I know. Yeah, yeah, and it is like uh like uh, Timothy Chalamet's character, like uh that is that's the kind of guy I like ideally like you know uh i i like kind of that body type someone who's intelligent active uh when he lit up a cigarette it was one of those moments where oh <laughs> you know yeah. i kind of like got turned off mm, to his yeah. to his character a bit but yeah i had to remind myself that's just what everybody was doing back then everybody was smoking but uh yeah no it was uh it was yeah, it was interesting all right cool this was, though, Timothy Chalamet's breakout role. He had done a couple of uh, smaller films, and uh, he had a role in Interstellar from Christopher Nolan, uh, maybe a couple of years before that. Uh, but this was really his breakout role. And so he is, in six short years, he has gone from this little $3 million movie to, like, superstardom. Okay. Where he's where he's headlining a two part Dune movie and uh, and being the the savior of Arrakis, so uh, yeah, he's doing pretty well for himself. Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, you want to go ahead and give this movie a rating? Yeah, I hope this doesn't disappoint you too much. Uh, this is below average for me. Uh, huh. I I would say uh, this is a three. I liked it better than Power of the Dog. It's sort of in that same, like, slow, gay, period piece mm. uh, genre. And I and I definitely found a lot more enjoyment out of this than I did out of that movie. Because I felt like I understood what was going on in this movie. Where I was completely lost in Power of the Dog. But ultimately, this didn't really, this didn't really do it for me. Interesting. I am a little surprised at that, to be honest. I, I, I thought that you would be more into um into it now do you have you ever watched a uh like any of the kind of gay themed movies is there any gay movie that you feel that you have connected with a gay a uh, gay romance uh yeah, romance coming of age well i mean kind of uh, like i you know obviously i love the birdcage but that's a different that's a different yeah. thing entirely. A, yeah, it's a farce. Um, right. Well, that's why I that's why I clarified with romance. Um, I'm not sure. I, are there uh, name a few that that I might have liked? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the big one would be uh, Brokeback Mountain. If you saw that, I never saw that. I'm interesting. I, yeah, I feel bad that I've never seen that, but I never saw it. No. I might put that on my list. I've only seen that once. It's also not a favorite of mine. Um, I, yeah. I, I'm trying to think of if I have. I mean, speaking of favorites, slow period um, pieces that are gay, yeah. You know, I did like. I it's weird because I am kind of a sucker for a coming of age movie, and I think that um, I think I said that when we watched Easy A. And uh, the there there's a movie called um, called Love Simon, I oh, believe. Oh yeah. That was big yeah. a few years ago, and uh, I did like that one a lot. It's uh, it made me cry, but that's just the you know the, yeah. the 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 kid in me going ah I wish I'd been that open when I was that age, mm -hmm. or I wish I'd had that you know option. Yeah, so. I would say that in general, I'm more of a romantic comedy person mm. than a romance person. All uh, right, I wasn't put off by the gayness of their relationship. 
it really no, I, was. I knew you wouldn't be. Yeah, no, I know. It was just the it was just the pace, and sure. the you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, on it, honestly, okay. it was just kind of down to the pace and like the sparseness of the story. Got it. And I and I think that that turned me off the first time through too, which is why I've never I haven't revisited this movie in the last six years or so. I will say though, I did appreciate it much more this time. I'm gonna give it upwards of a uh, of a seven. I think. Oh my. Wow. Yeah, um, because what I really loved is the uh, the acting uh, was is just really exquisite and 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 maybe not the script but the storytelling I thought was really great and uh, you know you you say you pointed out that they don't um, explicitly give you a lot of information but I think that's a really talented thing to do like you have to be good at this show don't tell. Uh, thing that they tell every writer to. Well, uh, I mean, I think we've talked about that before, that that's not my favorite. Like, I, I don't like, this is, I, this is entirely on me, but I don't like having to work too hard. Oh, I get you. you. I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of subtext either. Um, But I think that in this case, it was done fairly skillfully in a way that was, it was clear what was going on and, and what was necessary for the characters to be doing, um, you know, for, to get to a point where Elio was like, uh, I didn't know if you liked me, you know, or, you know, stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I, I I liked it for those reasons. So, uh, yeah, a couple of different aspects. All cool. Right. Well, yeah. moving on to the music, tell me about uh, tell me about this band. Yes, yeah, Screaming Females. So, Screaming Females is a three piece band that was formed in New Jersey in the early two thousands. Uh, they were school school pals, kind of like the Beths, actually, uh, from a from a week or two ago. Uh, they're led by guitarist and vocalist Marissa Paternoster, and she is. One of those guitarists who you can tell spent her entire teenage years locked in her bedroom playing guitar uh, hmm. to exhaustion. They released, they self-released a couple of albums and then got signed to uh, Don Giovanni Records uh, in 2009 and released three albums in quick succession. And then they've slowed down since then. Uh, they just released their eighth record this year. I think it's fantastic. It's called Desire Pathway. But I gave you a playlist this week because I wanted you to have a little wider ranging uh, experience of them. The one thing about Desire Pathway is that they are sort of uh, what passes for three minute pop songs uh, mm-hmm. on this band. And, as I'm sure you heard this week, they actually have a pretty wide variety of guitar-based music that they do. The real high point for me is the song uh, Because the Night, which I referred to last week as a 10,000 Maniacs song. But I, as I was researching for today, I was reminded that it is not a 10,000 Maniacs song. It's a Bruce Springsteen and Patti Smith song that 10,000 Maniacs famously covered in their Unplugged session. Uh, oh. And then Garbage and Marissa Pattern, oh, and all of Screaming Females covered mm-hmm. uh, for this. There's a fantastic video that I really hope you did get a chance to watch. I did. Uh, and, uh, oh, and I'm also going to mention the thing that people always mention about Marissa Pattern is that in 2012, Spin referred to her as the 77th greatest guitar player of all time, which is <laughs> crazy because she was and remains the lead singer of a power trio that sells like a few thousand copies of each record so the fact that she gets the fact that she gets noticed at that level to me is really an indication of like how well respected she is as a guitar player okay yeah uh she is great um and uh so the, the how i felt about this playlist is actually similar in uh, kind of totality to how I felt about uh, last week's playlist, but there are things I liked better and there are things I liked not as well. And they are uh, as follows. <laughs> they... <laughs> So I, one of the big things that, uh, that Screaming Females does well that I thought that Paramore maybe lacked is that Screaming females have a sound. Mm-hmm. They have, it, it, they are identifiable. It is, it could be, because even though they have a variety of different songs, 
their sound is is like their connective tissue where you can look you listen to a song and be like oh that's screaming females i i i recognize that um even if you've never heard the song before and uh, so that was good and i think a indication of a good um of a, of a good trio and and as you say if they've been at it for a long time i see just in the playlist we have probably five or six albums represented just in a 10 song playlist so they've definitely been at it and uh, and been productive i um the the lead singer uh, is also the lead guitarist is that what you're saying she is yes okay yep. so i will say her guitar work is great you can hear it in uh in real uh fashion at the end of the because the night cover they there is like a minute or more of just her jamming on the guitar and it's uh, it's it is impressive and you can you can hear that even as a novice as i am uh i she has a particular sound in her voice and she the what she does is she throws a lot of vibrato into her singing and i didn't love that after a while i think that it's I think that's that's her sound. It's what she's done to kind of like set herself apart. Um, I think maybe she does it a little too much, but just again, it if it 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 got to a point where I was noticing it, and I don't know how to say that that's that's I don't know how to say it as far as what you know. I don't know how to put words to it, you know, but it yeah. was just a thing that I was like, uh, I was like, I, I, I didn't love it after a while. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the there also wasn't as much variety of types of song as there was in uh, in the Paramore album. Like I thought sure. Paramore did that better, where you have your kind of ballad, but you also have your rock. This was a lot of rock. This mm -hmm. was like you know big big time rock, um, and they do that very well. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they kind of had the skill with hooks mm -hmm. that Paramore had. Like, sure. after listening to this album uh, or this playlist, I kind of felt like, yeah, most of it was kind of felt similar uh, okay. to me. And that also might be something uh, I'll allow would would be, would clarify itself in my head over time on repeated viewings uh, or repeated listenings. But I will say, I would listen to this, I would listen to this playlist again for sure. Really? Well, yeah. that is yeah. interesting news to me. I think once again, I am very bad at predicting what you're going to like because hmm. I I wanted to give you this album or this this band twenty weeks ago. I've been I've been listening to their new album Desire Pathway on repeat for quite a while. I'm super duper excited because they're going to be playing here in Milwaukee in about a month and a half. Oh, cool. They're playing a tiny little club that holds maybe a hundred people, so I'm gonna be right up there uh, in everybody's face. I'm super duper nice. looking forward to it. I love that kind of intimate setting. Yes, me too. And so, but I was afraid that this was gonna be. I I actually sent Travis a message before I sent him this playlist that is. Uh, I, I basically asked him explicitly, how open are you to having your face melted by a sick guitar solo? And I meant it because for, you know, because the night, Travis says it was a minute long guitar solo. Travis is wrong. It is a two minute long guitar solo with wow. several parts. And I am not. I'm not generally like I like heavy music and I like rock music, but a two minute guitar solo is a very, very long guitar solo. And I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not generally there for it. But boy, yeah. that one, like the way that she takes what is a very straightforward song structure and moves around the fretboard and plays lots of it's not like she's playing the same thing over and over and over again she's moving with different parts using different techniques doing crazy crazy stuff up and down the fretboard making different sounds with her guitar and like it is this thing where you just are sort of impressed with like the majesty of it all, even if maybe the, you know, maybe it's too aggressive or maybe too harsh, like yeah. musically, uh, you know, you and, can't deny the skill and, uh, you know, it's right. Just, yeah. 
Yeah. It's one of those things where you just like this person has an ability that uh, that I will never have. And it's yeah, I, you have to respect that. Yeah. And I think the, the other reason that I wanted you to watch the video is the members of Garbage are all like really highly accomplished uh, music players and producers. Shirley Manson is a fantastic vocal vocalist from the 90s. And this woman, Marissa Paternoster, <laughs> goes into the booth and just has them all basically in awe watching her just do her thing. And they're all just like playing along very, you know, like supporting her. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like you go get them tiger right and i just yeah. love that i love that yeah. sort of community of music and musicians uh who are willing to like share the spotlight because obviously it's a hugely high profile thing for for screaming females to do anything with garbage because garbage is probably a thousand times more famous than screaming females. really oh wow. yeah yeah and so for them to get that opportunity to do that and to then and then to showcase her and and tear it up is really uh it's it's wonderful i love well, that's that. good that's, that's something i didn't realize because uh, of course i really have no frame of reference for for <laughs> fame level of of these bands that i've never heard of right but um yeah, no, it was. Uh, she definitely was great. There is one thing I want to read, uh, and this is the um, y- using the the first song on the playlist is Brass Bell from the album Brass Bell, and it they did this thing where, and I've heard this before in a song where they'll start with noise, mm-hmm. right? The album, the song starts with noise, and noise builds and builds and builds and builds and builds, and then cuts off, and you get a nice rhythm and a nice drum and a nice you know guitar mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, yeah. Queen does this. Uh, in famously in a song that I remember liking as a kid, where it was this, uh, it, it used this stereo thing that goes through your head and mm-hmm. uh, and builds and builds, and all of a sudden is open up your mind and let me step inside. You know that song, mm-hmm. and um, this song tries to do something similar to that, but I found it really. It was starting to hurt my ears, <laughs> and I was like, I knew what it was doing because you can sense that buildup as it's going. But I and I knew that it was going to stop and like start a song, or at least I hoped it did, and it did. But by the time it got there, I was like, I was like, they don't need that. It didn't add anything to the song. You could have just started with the song. In my humble uh, non girl rock opinion. <laughs> That's that's totally fair. That's totally fair. But otherwise, otherwise the album was uh, the other uh, the album was enjoyable. Uh, it felt a little um, a little samey, but uh, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, cool. I didn't have a and part of part of the problem with the sameness of it was I didn't have a favorite song. Like of course because the night is a great song and they mm-hmm. they did a great cover. But even that the the cover didn't. I went back and listened to the original. Uh-huh. It didn't sound too much different. To mm-hmm. me, other than sure. the other than the jam and guitar solo, uh-huh. um, so so I don't want to have that be my favorite song because technically, like it's actually the other version <laughs> that I really love. But uh, yeah, well, I'll uh, tell it, you what was, my favorite song is on there. The yeah, second track that I gave you is called "I'll Make You Sorry," mm-hmm. and I there's some lyrics in this that I absolutely love. I once was in love before I knew you. I'd given up. I once was in love before you. Uh that chorus uh and then sort of it goes with like this really kind of bouncy jangly rhythm, but it's a mm-hmm. fundamentally very sad thing to say, you know. I was I was in love before I knew you and I'd given up and I was, you know, I was in love before you. And what it you know, seems to imply is, is this isn't going to work out. Right. You know, and it's, uh, Oh, it's, interesting. That is not at all how I heard it. Yeah. Well, uh, the song is called, I'll make you sorry. <laughs> right. Right. But I thought it was a, um, it was someone who doesn't have faith in their ability to love this new person that they've met. Um, right. Or right. for them to love it. So I didn't think it was the same person that when, when she said I once was in love before I knew you, I thought that was the I loved and it didn't work out. Mm-hmm. So here I am falling for you and I can tell you I'm going to make you sorry because mm-hmm. I don't have faith in my ability to love or be loved. Yeah, that's no, kind of how I was seeing it. 
Yeah, I, th- I mean, I m- maybe I didn't express myself well, but yes, that that is also how I, how I would interpret oh, okay. that song. Because, yeah. well, the, what I thought you were saying is also a very interesting take on this same thing, where it's, I fell in love with you, but mm. then I got to know you. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I, I like your take. I okay. like your take, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, they're both very, they're both interesting, but uh, yeah, that, that's good. It's good poetry for sure. Well, I'm and, super excited that you're not going to give this a one, Travis. What are? It's you not going to be a one. But before I do give oh, okay. my rating, I will say one more thing, one more, Ooh, one more tell. problem that I had with it, and that relates to this poetry, which is great, uh, is that it does fail a little bit in my. Um, easy to understand lyrics Mm kind of category that i like you know yeah and i think the vibrato hurts her there Mm -hmm. like i feel like it does you know she does do a lot of like long held notes that sometimes make it hard to enunciate yeah yeah so um so i'm gonna give it a six Um, oh wow yeah better than average uh and i wouldn't mind listening to it again and getting uh you know getting closer to this music uh over time uh if someone puts it on i'm not going to be upset for sure <laughs> wow that's that's fantastic travis. really you didn't I, expect that to be that good i travis when i gave this to you i was giving it to you with the intention of exposing our listeners to it oh. hoping that some of them would find it and love it don't care because... about them they're they don't they don't they're they're not paying the bills yet <laughs> well i'm glad you gave it a six i give it a 10. Yes, that's right. <gasps> that once again, Matt's great inflation is in full effect. I love this music. Uh, I give it a 10. Wow. Okay. I didn't I didn't know that this was one of your absolute favorite uh, uh, bands, so that's great. I love it. Hi, Mom. Yes, that's <laughs> right. My mom listens to the podcast now, too. Oh, my gosh. Hi, Matt's mom. Um, yeah. We should uh, I, I th- we should get your mom and my mom uh, to meet sometime. I think we, they would like each other. We should get them together on the podcast. That's what we should do. We should have, oh, we should have a very special... I don't know if my mom special... is techni- technically... Uh, although my mom was on her own podcast this last week. No uh, way. She wrote a book, and so yeah, she I was remember. on a literary podcast. Oh, uh, that's wonderful news. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, next time you're in uh, her hometown, you can uh, get her set up, and then we'll do like a very special Mother Day, Mother's Day episode. Oh, that would be that would be fantastic. We'll we'll hopefully that will happen someday. Um, listen, viewers, uh, help us make that happen by sharing the podcast uh, with your friends. Let them know how much you like listening to it and uh, and exposing yourself to the things we're exposing ourselves to, and that will help us grow. And then maybe we'll get a budget someday for special things like live shows and uh, and moms getting together. Well, what have you got for me for next week, Matt? Next week, Travis, we have a very special episode <gasps> coming up. That's right, episode 40. Ooh. Those of you who have never listened to the podcast before, every 10 episodes, we give each other assignments of things that neither of us has watched or listened to before. So... Uh, in the past, I've given him Alice in Chains Unplugged, uh, Radiohead, OK Computer, classic albums that I had missed out on. But this week, this week, Travis, you uh-huh. are going to get to hear very recent album from pop star Olivia Rodrigo. Olivia oh. Rodrigo. Oh, do you know who that I've is? I've heard of her. <laughs> oh, nice. Well, she's very, very popular right now. She's had a little bit of beef with Taylor Swift. She's had a bunch of hit singles. And last month, her new album, uh, Guts, came out. And it's got a song on it called Vampire, so it's a little uh, spooky-themed. Uh, and I have not listened to it yet. And I thought, I was going to listen to it the other day, and I thought, no, this is perfect for the podcast. That's great. Yeah, now we can check it out together. What have you got for me? And it's on YouTube Music, right? Oh, yeah, it's on YouTube Music, yes. Yeah, so we can just listen to the whole thing together. That's extraordinary. I love this. Uh, I am excited about this plan. And uh, all right, well, I want to give you also a October-themed... Uh, I think I'm going to give you kind of scary movies for the rest of the month. And uh, I wanted to give you a, a double feature, if that's okay. How do you feel about oh, that? Uh, oh, man, I was going to try to do the double feature song from Rocky Horror, but I apologize. I, I, you I know what? Know I, I've head. never actually seen Rocky Horror Picture Show, which maybe that should have been my choice for this uh but wow. you've seen it 
So wow. obviously you you're familiar. Maybe um, episode fifty then. But, yeah, uh, maybe yeah. our our where we flip things up. Um, so I I'm going to give you a movie that was a it was first a, a well regarded foreign film that was made into an American film. Uh, okay. It might be true that the American film isn't as good. I don't know. I'm generally not a big fan of of foreign films. Like I don't I'm not I don't like reading subtitles. I don't know. Sue me. Uh, but I'm going to give you the. <laughs> Uh, it also is a vampire theme, uh, coincidentally enough. And I'm going to give you the movie, Let the Right One In. Uh, it, and that's what it was called in the original Swedish version, Let the okay. Right One In. And then I think the American version is called Let Me In. Um, but the uh, the Swedish version came out uh, in oh, 2008, and um, it was remade... Um, I don't know anything about the original version. Um, it, 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 it's. I think the thing that really intrigues me about it is it's a story of a a twelve year old boy who lives alone with his uh, mom and um, and this young vampire, this you know also twelve year old looking vampire, befriends him. Uh, I, mm. I think I don't. I don't actually know. Um, I think that in the remake, uh, uh, Chloe Grace Moretz, uh, who you may or may not know, starred in the remake. Um, so they might have gender swapped the main characters, or she plays the vampire. I I, I don't actually know. I'm intrigued to find out because I've been trying to avoid spoiling this movie for myself that, for at least ten years now. <laughs> that was some great wild speculation there, Travis. Let's see if it yeah. pays off. Yeah, they both are available to stream on uh, different streaming uh, channels. So if you want to read, uh, watch along with us, viewers, you can and um, and see what you think. Expose yourself. When we expose ourselves, I do like that this is like an ultra, like we are like a ultra exposure, like high exposure uh, <laughs> episode. There's so much exposure going on over yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. All right. all right. Well, that's all we got, I think. Uh, don't forget to uh, to like us, make a do, leave a review also, in addition to sharing the show on uh, whatever podcast app you're listening to this. Sometimes you have to scroll all the way bottom to, of the app to get to where you can leave a rating, but it definitely helps us, and it's the easiest thing you can do, dear viewer. And uh, Matt. Yes, Travis. Thank you for exposing yourself to me. Well, you're welcome, Travis. Thank you for exposing yourself to me. I love doing it. All right, I'll see you next week. (laughs) Bye-bye.